Good day, Thomas Jefferson Hour podcast listeners. And as always, we so thank you for listening. And also, thank those of you who have uh, decided to support the show. You know, we got an email. I'm not going to say who it was from just recently, but a very nice woman. One of those letters that you read and it just kind of makes you blush. She said, after these last few weeks during the pandemic and listening how much, uh, <laughs> I think there's a thing in there about she wanted to read more, but um, she ended up watching more TV and throwing her shoe at the TV a lot. And then she found the show and it really helped her a lot. And she wanted to increase her paltry $5 a month contribution to the Jefferson Hour to $20 a month. And I thought, wow, bless your heart. And anyway, so I, that's just a backhanded way of, of, of getting into if you can support the show. We really appreciate it. We don't take anything for doing this. Those Reading those letters is our reward. And the kind of, for me, being able to sit back and listen to you and Joe Ellis, it's just great. So uh, if you can support the show, we really appreciate that. Go to jeffersonhour.com to do that. You can also find out about everything Clay has going on, which is a lot. His books, his latest uh, comedy album is out, and I'm sure he will tell you in great detail about each one of those things, won't you, sir? I'd love to. Uh, I won't, but, <laughs> but this is the year of, of four books and a CD. So in February, along with Char Miller of Pomona, I published uh, at the University of Nebraska Press a book called Theodore Roosevelt, The Naturalist in the Arena. Um, that's right, been yeah, doing very well. Then right, um, that was good. In, in early June, I released a, a book called Bring, in, Bring Out Your Dead, uh, The Literature and History of Pandemics, which is a, an Amazon book, which you can find on Kindle and Amazon.com. And it's a set of essays about the history of pandemics and, and literature like Camus' uh, the, the Plague and um, Daniel Defoe's Journal of the Plague Year and so on but also a series of essays that I'm very proud of on the art of reading or the joy of reading. And then the third book is coming out by the time people hear this. It's uh, the uh, Repairing Jefferson's America book that I've been working on for the past year. And then uh, I'm just wrapping up. This has been such a fruitful period for me, David, because I'm sheltering in place with my beloved daughter, Catherine, here in Dakota. And I've been working on my big book on the on North Dakota, and it's just about finished. I've got just a few little revisions to make in one field trip. Its working title is, So Who Are We Now? North Dakota at the Crossroads. That probably isn't the final title, but you, that gives you a sense of what I'm trying to get at. We're the last visited state and the least visited state. And then there's my comedy album from Norfolk, Virginia. It's now out on Spotify, on iTunes, which is now, I believe, Apple, and on Amazon, so people can get tracks of it or the entire album there, or if they want, they can write to me uh, via the Jefferson Hour, and I will sign and send a physical CD, produced, by the way, uh, by your son, uh, Mr. Graham Swenson. So all of that is out and more is coming. I'm writing for governing.com. The Jefferson Hour, I think, has reached a new pinnacle thanks to the frequent uh, visitation by Joseph Ellis. And I got a call this morning, David, from uh, David Nicandri out in Washington. He said he's been listening avidly uh, to the, the Ellis uh, conversations and loving them. And he suggested that we get the entire roster of our frequent guests, Chrysler, Bo, uh, Dr. Ellis, Nicandri, my daughter, Catherine, and that we, we form a Zoom and we do a couple of Zoom conversations of the whole team. That, and we talk about a variety of things, but that we, we put everyone who is a frequent guest, including Pat Bradowski, on a, on a Zoom call and do one or two programs based on it. Uh, this week's show is great. You both agreed to answer listener questions. And so we did a bit of a, a breakdown of the uh, famous grudge cage match, The Indispensable Man. And without giving much away, I will say that Gina Douglas came out as a, a hero again and that uh, Franklin's stock has risen somewhat based on the letters we got. And then there were a number of other um, really interesting emails that uh, we... In fact, after the show, Joe Ellis said to both of us, well, you really have some intelligent listeners writing great, great. letters in. Yeah, I thought the letters were terrific. One asked me why I make fun of, of John Adams. I also got a letter that I don't think you saw from someone who um, from Williamsburg who said... Nice show, guys, but uh, you're both morons. And the real hero of the American Revolution was Robert Morris, the financier. And if he yeah, had, yeah, I think he sent that right to you. I didn't see if that. If he hadn't one, yeah. uh, 
created the infrastructure that allowed us to finance the revolution. The war would have been over almost immediately. You two knuckleheads uh, obviously don't really know what you're talking about. I took that in good stead, but I thought, yeah, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be taking on Joe Ellis if I were you. With that, uh, to, let's the go show. to the show. I do want to say though that next week the two of you gentlemen take on a very serious topic, and that is uh, monuments. And uh, so look forward to that next week. Thanks, David. We'll see you all. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks for supporting the Thomas Jefferson Hour. Good day, citizens, and welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. I'm your host, David Swenson, and this week. We welcome our returning champion and semi-permanent guest, Professor Joseph Ellis, and as always, the creator of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, the award-winning humanities scholar and author, Clay Jenkinson. And gentlemen, I have before me some very interesting questions for the both of you, uh, sent in by our Jefferson Hour listeners. But before we go there, I think it's proper that I share with the both of you some of the responses to the Indispensable Man show that was broadcast several weeks ago. You you both recall. I the think. cage match, the grudge match. Yes. And as you remember, we had no real clear winner, although um, the three leaders at the time were Washington, Franklin, and Jefferson. So here's just a few of the comments we received. Scott Blake wrote in, he said that he was swayed by Gina Douglas's excellent argument for Franklin. Do you recall uh, the, the the listener that sent that, Gina? Yeah, she was great. She really knew what she was talking about. Yeah. His list was Franklin, Washington, Jefferson. And Gina Douglas actually wrote us again, said, having listened to the arguments in this episode, my conclusion is that there was a cadre of people who were collectively indispensable to the founding of the nation. Without any one of them, the revolution probably still would have succeeded, but our nation would be substantially different. Thoughts on that, sir? I think it's another insight by this woman who is extremely cogent, it seems to me. And in fact, I think you can make a case that it's the collective that makes it distinctive and special and successful, and that there's a kind of built-in checks and balances in the personalities that led the American founding that is equivalent to the checks and balances officially or legally built into the Constitution. Um, and that you need Jefferson, but if you just have Jefferson, you verge on anarchy. You need Hamilton, but if you depend on him, you might be headed towards totalitarianism. And so I think the collective is, in the end, the, the real special American thing, and any single person would um, would probably uh, hopefully agree with that. I agree with uh, Gina and and with, of course, Professor Ellis. Uh, I, I, I continue to believe that Jefferson is the indispensable man, but you don't want to give him sole authority. You need some pragmatists and you need some realists in that mix, but you want Jefferson to be empowered. You want to give him a MacArthur grant. And you want to put him in a room somewhere <laughs> with his polygraph and say, just dream, dream of, of, of America, dream of an agrarian republic, dream of, of, of self-actualized people, dream of an ideal educational system, dream, dream the entire software of a successful, small R Republican society. And we'll take it under advisement, sir. And then you want Adams to come in and say, and sputter a lot and say, oh, you know, he may, that, that he may have thought that would work, but uh, try that in the real world, Mr. Jefferson. And then you want someone like Madison as a broker in between who, you know, Madison, uh, do you tell me if, if, if I'm right about this, Joe, Madison's um, mission was to listen to Jefferson's utopian flights and then to say how much of this can realistically be made to happen and how much of it do I need to really check against the wilder effusions of Jefferson's imagination and rhetoric? But but he, he made a good faith effort to do as much as he thought the world could actually absorb of Jefferson's philosophy. I like it. I, I would say, you know, what we were saying at some point when we did an Adams and Jefferson program, that they're the kind of words and music of the uh, revolutionary song. And you can't have the song if you don't have the words or you don't have the music. Um, I think that Madison, 
a lot of things that we call Jeffersonian are really Madisonian. Um, that is, they're implementations of a Jeffersonian vision in a political, specific political framework. Um, Henry Adams said that that they that Madison is, you know, he's Jefferson's protege to be sure, but um, uh, Jefferson knew what he was saying at the end of his life when the last words he spoke to Madison were, "Take care of me when I am dead." And he did. Whenever I'm down on Jefferson, whenever I think of him as a bubble-headed theorist, then I remember that Madison, who was none of those things, gave his life to Jefferson and never broke with him, never turned away, never broke the spell and said, I just, I just can't do it. He's, he's great, but I just can't uh, allow myself to be the, the grounding force for a person who is so insufficiently attached to the real world. And so that makes me think that there was something about Jefferson that you and I don't really understand yet that was so compelling and so persuasive and so beautiful that a person who was really a, great, a much better thinker than he was, James Madison, found it irresistible. Gina ends her uh, comments by saying, so maybe the revolution fails without either Washington or Franklin. But maybe the nation fails if Adams beats Jefferson in 1800, and sh she suggests that that might be a great topic for a rematch. Ah. I have a question for Joe that comes straight out of this. So I got a nasty email from a listener saying, look, Adams is a much greater man than Jefferson, and Adams would have probably been reelected in 1800 if Jefferson hadn't uh, pulled out all stops to hire a ruffian to write dirt on Adams and the Adams administration. And I wrote back and said, I, I don't think that, that James Callender's work was in any way um, definitive in the election of 1800, that if Jefferson had never met James Callender, I don't think the results probably would have been any different. But I wanted to put that to you, Joe. I think what you say is plausible. You can't go back and run the tape and know for sure. But I would side with the the observation on this, I mean, I'm a, I'm an Adams guy in the way that you're a Jefferson guy. On the one hand, I think not calendar, but that Jefferson was called by the Federalists after he won the Negro president because he wouldn't have won if the Electoral College didn't provide additional electoral votes to Southern states because of the three fifths clause. That said, what would have happened with the Louisiana Purchase if Adams were president? I don't think we would have got Louisiana. No, he wouldn't have done it. There's real leadership in Jefferson in that moment. Chip Crawford wrote, and you'll you'll like this, Joe, uh, no other founder enjoyed as much distraction from their shortcomings than the magnificent Dr. Franklin. I suppose owning the presses helped perfume the odor of his infidelity. For my part, Adams is the indispensable person, having talked immovable egos into unanimity. He obnoxiously spoke independence into reality and kept us from Hamilton's war that would have crushed the teenaged republic. And then finally, Gino Kukale wrote, they all had their place during this time and they all played their instruments beautiful. But if I had an answer to the question, the man would be what we are today. The American dream is the man. Without that notion, dream, drive, etc., none of those men would have done what they did. That's what makes this country so great. A common cause, a common agreement made the most astounding accomplishment in the world happen. America. America is the indispensable man. We've got some great listeners out there. I mean, they have we ideas that, that play off what we said and carry them to different and higher levels. Um, I do think that the original remark about Franklin is a little bit of a put down that the British, when they were negotiating the Treaty of Paris in 1782-83, the British kept writing letters to each other saying it's absolutely unfair and stupid and, and just unfair that this land of bumpkins happens to have the greatest diplomat in in recorded history, you know, the world champion diplomat running the show for them. And we can't, he is the American Prometheus, they call him. That's Franklin. And Franklin really is the guy that produces the most lopsided uh, diplomatic triumph in American history when we get both independence and a third of a continent. He's the guy that makes that happen. 
And, and he actually goes back to the French foreign minister, Vergenz, who he's about ready to sell out to, uh, and ask for more money. <laughs> I, I, if you, Franklin is amazing. And, um, and, uh, and he's the grandfather amongst the fathers, but even he, at his end, near his end, he, when he knew he was ready to go, he, he gave his, um, his walking stick, uh, to, to Washington and said that uh, you will be marching into immortality with my stick. Huh. David, I just want to say to the first letter, I really disagree with the notion that Franklin was a, a roué or a womanizer or a flanderer. There were some uh, incidents earlier in his life, but when he was in Europe, in England and in France, he played a role, and it was a part of his political theater to flirt with these aristocratic women and to... Um, to say uh, things which appeared to suggest that he uh, was interested in having relations with them, and, and many of them flirted back. And there was a sort of a playful uh, exchange of familiarities and intimacies, but this really isn't true about his actual behavior. It was more of a pose, and it was a pose that was quite common, actually, in European and especially French aristocratic circles. And somehow the the, the, the myth has grown up that Franklin was this womanizer, which I think really misunderstands the essential playfulness of his character. But what do you think, Joe? I agree. I agree. Well, the, I think that the final letter from Gino is, is uh, uh, America is, is the indispensable person. Um, the spirit of Americans, uh, of course, not all at, at that time, but the spirit of Americans is what was, was indispensable. So that's well, that's big- the reason, and that's the reason why. Why even when I technically win a debate with Clay, <laughs> I know that he's right in some extremely basic fact that Jefferson wrote the magic words of American history. Yeah, the inspiration, and that as we get through this pandemic, and when and we face up to the fact that we need to rethink the meaning of the civil rights movement for our time that the magic words are the words that will guide the decision that we make they're they're an expanded meaning of what jefferson intended but they are the words and if you read shakespeare and you say gee how could shakespeare say this about hamlet he hadn't even read freud (laughs) and like well but they're the words they're right there and he wrote them We need to take a short break, gentlemen. When we come back, I have some more very thought-provoking questions submitted by the Thomas Jefferson Hour listeners. We'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to The Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation about all things Jefferson. This week, we're speaking with the creator of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. Clay Jenkinson, and one of our favorite friends of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Professor Joseph Ellis. Welcome back, gentlemen. It's great to be back. You know, a, a contest with Joe Ellis is is a little Lilliputian against a giant. Um, and, and furthermore, you know, Joe's not um, averse to eye gouging and bringing foreign objects into the circle, but I, w- I, won't, I won't even uh, attend to some of the the many attempts he's made to do a cheap shot here, but well, it, changing the subject, uh, changing the spirit of the discussion. Let's move on to some letters from listeners. We, I'll begin with a very kind letter that we received from Rosemary Staples from Hilton Head Island in South Carolina. She writes, "I stumbled onto the Jefferson Hour by chance in June while listening to Founding Fathers for the umpteenth time." Maybe Joe's upgraded to a podcast, I thought. One quick Google click later, I discovered you guys and Joe and found myself enthralled with your remarkably informative, entertaining, heart-filled, soulful, and spirited show. How's that? I listen to you daily often uh, over and over, and I thank you for your commitment and generosity. She goes on to write some very complimentary things, which I'll leave out. But at the end of the letter, she writes, 2020 is the 100th year anniversary of women's right to vote. And the faces of 14 famous suffragettes will be projected onto Mount Rushmore for 14 days next month. 
She suggests that that would be a worthy topic for discussion, and of course she's right. I like the idea, and I think she's right about the significance of this anniversary. There is, a, I think, a PBS special running on this that's very good, very documentary special on the women's movement. I think that in that discussion, I have the advantage, and I will concede that it's an advantage over poor Clay, because I Adams was married to the world's greatest uh, woman um, and, the, and an equal partner, Saucy Abigail. Abigail kind of mystified Jefferson because he was used to dealing with women who uh, you know, were presumed, you know, they would study the harpsichord and sewing, but they wouldn't be reading Shakespeare. I think Gallatin, his secretary of treasury, said there are some people who think we might wish to appoint a woman to the cabinet. And Jefferson said, um, I do not believe the American people are ready for that, nor may I add, am I. That's correct. Uh, I do think it's a really worthy idea, and we should do this, because uh, one of the criticisms that we do get on this program is that it is a white male founding father uh, point of view frequently. I can I can only say this of, of Abigail Adams. I find her extraordinarily interesting uh, in some ways, at least as interesting as her um, husband, John. But I can say, uh, I think um, categorically, that if she and Jefferson were married, he would have been on the Lewis and Clark expedition looking for the Pacific. <laughs> you mean trying to get away from her? <laughs> I don't think he could have stood up under her scrutiny. I mean, she she was not afraid to talk truth to power. Well, he didn't. He didn't. <laughs> You've educated me, Clay, about it. She was one of the only people who really stood up to him. The, the, the exchange of 1804 after the death of his daughter, Maria, is one of the most startling uh, exchanges in correspondence in American history. And Jefferson had to actually leave the conversation because he realized that he was not going to persuade her with all of his blandishments and his grace as a as a writer of prose that she saw through the, the fibs and even lies that he told in that exchange, that she wasn't over the issue of calendar and the midnight appointments, and that she was going to skewer Jefferson. And Jefferson realized that there was no possible way that he was going to win this argument. And the best thing he could do is simply withdraw and hope that time would settle this. And time did eventually. She eventually uh, started to write little PSs on the bottom of John's letters to Jefferson. And they even exchanged a couple of slightly stiff letters themselves in the mid-1800s. Yeah, it's, uh, there's... I, I concur. In 1776, um, John writes a letter to Abigail. Says, "I've just bought a big um, what do you, I, it's like a tablet or something to keep as a record of all my letters. Meaning, I'm copying every one of my letters to you, and I want you to do the same thing with your letters to me." Because they want, they should be preserved for posterity. And he ends and says, "And the truth is, dear, that your letters are better written than mine, and his posterity will end up concluding that. And by and large, that's true." We got a letter from Thad Keel, uh, who lives in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, asking about the recent Supreme Court opinion. Uh, on the question of whether Article 2 and the Supremacy Clause categorically preclude or require a heightened standard for the issuance of a state criminal subpoena to a sitting president. He says, in the course of the opinion, the court recounted the involvement in the trial of first-term Vice President Aaron Burr, then charged with treason. And he goes on to ask that you discuss Jefferson's involvement in that trial, the events that led up to the charge against Mr. Burr, and the positions taken by Jefferson with respect to the issuance of a subpoena. Let me start, and then Joe can pick it up. Uh, first of all, uh, Adams and Jefferson had an exchange about a related topic. Uh, it's a little um, bit hard to explain, but I'll do it quickly, that a man named Edward Livingston had some property on the beach of the lower Mississippi River at New Orleans. And he eventually sued Jefferson and the United States government for Jefferson's handling of the confiscation of that property uh, during Jefferson's administration. And Jefferson was terrified by this because he thought that it could ruin him financially and that it could really damage his reputation. So he did a lot of really serious research. This is called the Batur case. And he wrote this pamphlet 
And one of the things that he did was send the, the completed pamphlet to John Adams. And Adams wrote and said, this is a masterful piece of work. It's a, it's a perfect example of your of your your legal acumen and genius. It's a it's a it shows that there's no diminution in your mighty powers of mind since you left the presidency, unlike mine. And he said some self-effacing things. And so they actually wrote about whether a president can be held accountable for policy decisions made during his administration by disgruntled citizens. So that's one. And Jefferson played a role in establishing a precedent that the that the the, the, the person who happened to be president is largely immune from uh, lawsuits uh, coming out of actual policy decisions that came down during that person's administration. Well, then there's the Burr issue. So I'll I'll just give the, the briefest possible summary of it. Burr was Jefferson's vice president. Jefferson dropped him summarily from the second term. Burr killed Hamilton in a duel. Burr was sort of uh, running out of options, so he got involved in a very murky uh, plan of some sort. We still don't really understand what happened, that he was going to either invade Mexico on behalf of the United States or he was going to uh, disentangle parts of the, the Southwest from the United States and, and, and make himself a kind of a Napoleonic dictator, or he was just on a filibustering mission and, and he was hoping for some adventure which would redeem his reputation, but he got involved in some very odd and and nefarious and murky affairs in the West. And eventually Jefferson tried to just outlast it and hope that it would go away. But eventually he had to have Burr arrested. Burr was tried in Richmond on a charge of treason. He was uh, not acquitted, but he was um, he's released as not convicted. Uh, and the presiding uh, judge in that trial was Chief Justice John Marshall, no friend to Jefferson. Uh, and Jefferson always felt that Marshall had allowed a, an obviously treasonous man to uh, escape legal punishment. But the part that, that set precedent was that um, Justice Marshall and Burr called for certain papers from the Jefferson administration pertaining to the Burr indictments, and Jefferson refused to comply. He, he invoked executive privilege, but he did say, he said, you cannot force the president to divulge papers of this sort. However, I will voluntarily release certain papers because that's what I think is, is the right thing to do. But you cannot compel me to release a single document because we must maintain the doctrine of separation of powers. So, Joe, where, wherever I got that wrong, correct me. I don't think there's anything wrong. I would just add that you're right. Marshall was the man put on earth by God to give Jefferson fits. And um, <laughs> even though they were cousins, distant cousins, he called uh, Marshall to Jefferson a kind of Buddha that had been placed in the middle of his administration by by Adams to give him hell. And the important thing legally about the decision was that Jefferson wanted Burr convicted of treason. And Marshall refused to do that. And it by so doing, he set a very high bar that became the landmark decision for treason in the United States. Still holds. It's a very high bar for treason. You can't convict somebody of treason unless you've really got a very strong case. And the case against Burr was murky. It was interesting that Mr. Justice Roberts, the Chief Justice now, acknowledging the greatness of Marshall, used it as a piece of evidence to support his decision that the president must respond to some of these requests, um, though in the decision, he doesn't have to do it now and he and can go back and make his own legal case again in lower courts. But I think that it's a moment when it's interesting, both sides in this can find a precedent for either forcing the executive to deliver the documents or uh, not. I do think the one issue on which both Marshall and Jefferson and Adams, all of them would agree, is that the core principle is that no man can stand above the law. Well, that's Adams more than either of the other two. That Adams himself is credited with saying that in our system, yeah. no man is above the law. I'll only say this. I think that, that Jefferson was right in invoking executive privilege, and I think he set a very important precedent to maintain the doctrine of separation of powers. But what Justice Roberts did 
um, a few weeks ago now was to say that a, a, an executive does not have an absolute That's right. immunity. And and furthermore, th- there's a difference here because in the in the case of, of Burr, these were documents relating to Burr's guilt or innocence and the and the administration's prosecution of the of the of the indictment. In the case of this one, this is a sitting president trying to invoke absolute executive immunity to protect himself from criminal prosecution or documents that pertain to the separation of powers need by Congress to oversee the executive. So in a sense, they're both right, don't you think, Joe? I do. I do. I mean, the one thing that's in the news now, the pardoning power accorded the president in the Constitution is really idiosyncratic. That is to say, I don't know how it happened. There's no debate over it in August of 70, 1787. Both Adams and Jefferson are not present. Adams is in England. Jefferson is in Paris for this. Uh, But Madison's there. And it's it really is the one monarchical piece of power that's planted in the Constitution. He he can pardon anybody, including himself. And even though that that right can be abused. And in my judgment, President uh, Trump's use of it and potential use of it over the next few months would be an abuse, has been, and is an, would be an abuse. Nevertheless, literally, he has that power. And and exactly how that ended up there be, is, is a mystery to me because there's nothing in the record. And the whole Constitutional Convention was conducted with, the, with monarchy as the ghost at the banquet. The last thing they want to do is create a George III. And um, so... I think that's going to come in the news when over I, my suspicion is that the president will end up pardoning himself and all members of his family before he leaves office. Just wanted to say that uh, Jefferson uh, himself used the pardon power. The first thing that he did uh, using that power as as the third president of the United States was to commute the sentences of men who had been convicted under the Sedition Act. And he also okay. ordered the return of the fines to those who had been incarcerated. And one of the problems was that the, the the return of the fine to James Callender, who was languishing in a Richmond, Virginia jail, did not come soon enough for Callender's tastes. And because he, he felt that he was not getting his uh, money back fast enough, um, and be, also he wanted a federal uh, patronage post, that's when he turned on Jefferson and broke the Sally Hemings story. And so if Jefferson had, had worked a little harder to conciliate James Callender, we might not know of the Sally Hemings story, or at least not in quite the same way. Again, that letter came from Thad Keel in Louisville. Um, and he ends the letter by saying that he re- would respectfully request uh, the two of you to share what you believe to be the best books or monographs on this particular subject. I would encourage you to seek the opinion of uh, Dr. Joseph Ellis. For all I know, he, quote, wrote a book on that. (laughs) Not yet. (laughs) If I did, I forget. (laughs) Read a a good Marshall biography. There's a couple of them that are out there. If you just look up John Marshall, they'll have a chapter on this. There is a whole book on it, and I can't remember the author. He teaches at the New York School of Law. It's pretty good legal but historical discussion of the Burr case. Um, yes. I wish I could remember more specifically, but my senility is is in the way. <laughs> no, that's what Jefferson would call our Senec Tootle senility. Um, in the letters with Adams, they both say, where has my garrulousness and loquacity taken me? Where is my Senec Tootle uh, senility uh, moving me? They both played the game uh, that their minds were beginning to fade, and neither uh, allegation of which was true. Well, let's move into the next question. It came from Dominic Frederick, and it's for you, Joe. He wants to know if you've ever considered learning Latin and and or Greek so you could read primary source documents used by founders to form our government. I had seven years of Latin and four years of Greek. I can read both languages. Wow. Very good. That answers that. I, but it's it's hard. I mean, you know, I mean, Adams, you know, used to tell John Quincy, you know, read through cities, of course, in the original Greek. And it's like, you know, the kid's five years old. And um, uh, they were all literate. And I think that the Latin and Greek, the classic language afforded them access to the classics, 
the founders are now our classics, um, but they had theirs. And it, I think that the that if you if your mind is shaped at all by Latin and Greek, it gives you a certain hmm, verbal style, and um, it it shapes the way in which you express yourself in language, especially in the written language. In fact, when they asked Mailer, Norman Mailer, you know, what's the most important course he took at Harvard as a writer? At first, he was joking. He said typing. And um, <laughs> but then he said Latin. And um, and I I think that there's something to that. Dominic also wants to know how much of a donation he'd have to make uh, for the two of you to do a two-part show on the book after the revolution. Uh, and that's, you've got, uh, your four main characters are Peel, Breckenridge, Dunlap, and Webster. Um, and, and he also wants to know how, Joe, how you have evolved from uh, the founding fathers, quote, walk on water to, quote, tear down Mount Rushmore. I don't even know if that's accurate. No, I've never said, tear down, oh, heavens, no, heavens, no, uh, I think we might get into that in our next program about the monuments and stuff. But um, well, what about doing a uh, what about doing a show on the book after the revolution? We're going to do it. You don't have to pay anything. You don't have to pay us a cent. We're going to do that book, which was one of the first books I did as a younger man, and uh, it's called After the Revolution, and it's a study of American culture, um, theater, uh, uh, literature and that kind of thing. And um, <laughs> I was cutting my teeth as a historian then, but uh, I'll go back, I'm gonna go back and reread it before I argue or answer questions from Clay about it over the ensuing weeks. But um, I don't think there's anything in it that I would um, deeply regret right now. Well, great, we'll look forward to that. Meanwhile, we need to take a short break. When we come back, I have a question about uh, Jefferson's, uh, which side he would be on during the Civil War were he alive. So I'll let you think on that, and uh, we'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to this special edition of The Thomas Jefferson Hour. I'm Clay Jenkinson, out of character this week, and sitting across from me, at least in an undisclosed Vermont cabin, is Joseph Ellis, the distinguished professor of early American history, the author of a dozen books, all extraordinary, some of them winners of the top awards offered to a writer or historian in American culture. He's a friend of this program, a friend of David's, a friend of mine, and we've had the glory during this pandemic of being able to really spend some time. And I can't tell either of you how many people have contacted me and said, more Joe Ellis, more conversations <laughs> with Joe Ellis, which I sort of resent because of, you know, for lots of reasons. But anyway. I really mean they want a Joe and Clay show. And That's I'm, it. I'm, but you know, it'd be like uh, Nichols and May and uh, the comedians, and I'll be <laughs> in May, and you can be Nichols. Back to uh, the question of Latin and Greek. So one of the things that's really remarkable about Jefferson and John Adams, and of course this would be true of John Quincy Adams too, is that they knew Latin perfectly, and they knew Greek extremely well. And this is uh, something that differentiates them from almost everybody. George Washington had. Uh, no Greek, and and just uh, he could do a few little phrases in Latin, but he wasn't uh, educated in that way. Madison uh, knew his Latin. Others didn't. Patrick Henry certainly didn't. Franklin dabbled in these things, but really uh, didn't give them much time. Uh, of all the founding fathers, Jefferson and John Adams are the true classicists, and both of them could read Plato and Thucydides in ancient Greek and without much of an apparatus. In fact, they have this really interesting exchange uh, in the last uh, period of their correspondence about Plato. And so they're kind of fishing around for subjects, and Jefferson says, oh, you know, I read Plato's Republic, and it's the dreariest thing that I ever read. I can't believe that he ever had the influence that he had, particularly on Christianity. And then <laughs> you can pick it up, Joe, but Adam says, yeah, I, I only learned two things from Plato. Remember what they were? No, I do remember his funny remark, but I don't remember what the punchline was. Uh, one of them was about the Aristoi, but the other one was a cure for hiccups. <laughs> he said, the only thing I learned is this cure for hiccups. He said, and then Jefferson said, well, what is the cure for hiccups? And Adam said, sneezing. And so here they're, they've taken the, the philosopher from the, the 4th century BC, who is said to be the, the fundamental philosopher of the West, you know, it said all 
philosophy as a footnote to Plato. And these two extraordinary classicists are are dismissing Plato as not worth a moment's actual in, uh, intelligent uh, conversation. It's a it's a great thing, but you couldn't you know imagine Gerald Ford and Richard Nixon having this conversation, or Bill Clinton and George W. Bush. We're talking about exceedingly well-educated men. And you make light of this, Joe, but to learn Greek, as I did and as you did, is not for the faint of heart. And no matter how much Greek you learn, you learn. I, you're I always a schoolboy. No, no longer can read it easily anymore. because You have to keep it, keep it fresh to do it. You know, with the Plato thing, in the in the Western philosophical tradition, Plato is the ultimate idealist, and Aristotle is the ultimate realist. Um, and you could make a case that Jefferson is Plato and that Adams is Aristotle, um, but they don't. They're talking about it, and they know what they're talking about, and they don't see it that way at all. Jefferson didn't see himself as a Platonist, but there's a lot of Platonic idealism with a capital I. In Jefferson. Absolutely. Back to our, our question about uh, uh, which side Jefferson would be on. It comes from Carol Crothers, a podcast listener, and she writes, if Jefferson was alive and a politician in the 1860s, would he be in on the side of the Union or the Confederacy? Answer is a very depressing one. I would say as a historian, almost certainly he would have sided with the Confederacy, as did his grandson, who played a role as a Confederate cabinet official. I concur. He never said anything about it himself. He's afraid of the Missouri crisis because it might provoke a civil war. And, and I mean, all he says is when that happens, everybody that lives south of the Ohio River needs to leave because it's going to be bloody. Um, I think it's clear that Washington commented on it. He said, if there is a civil war caused by slavery, I will be with the North. He said that before he died. Um, but I think Clay's right. During the last 15 to 20 years of his life, Jefferson recedes from leadership on the slavery issue and really communicates almost exclusively, um, apart from Adams, with pretty much um, the slaveocracy of, of uh, Virginia, and um, and he's disappointing, and he, he disappoints us at that moment in his life, and um, and he helps lead Virginia, which could have gone the other way. I would like to argue, um, he leads Virginia in the direction that will make it a member of the Confederacy, um, and um, and I I think it's unfortunate, but I don't think that. I mean, I think Clay's right. You can't be absolutely certain, but you can be pretty sure. Along those same lines, there's a, a letter from Ann Axelrod in Colorado Springs. I would appreciate a concise statement of how slavery brought financial ruin to the South. I only have a vague idea. Slavery brought absolute ruin to Virginia because tobacco had worn out the soil, and when tobacco was no longer capable of being the the cash crop, slavery became not cost effective. It cost more to maintain the slave population on a plantation. I think that after 1820, after the invention and implementation of the cotton gin, and once the emergence of cotton, slavery is profitable. I don't think slavery would have died a natural death without the war. It was robust, it, not in Virginia. And what Virginia did to its ultimate disgrace, was moved from raising tobacco to making slaves themselves its major major product. They sold slaves to the South. That's what the phrase, you know, selling them down the river came to mean. So breeding and selling slaves became the major economic activity of the Southern, pla of the Virginia plantations. The problem with the founders is, in this regard, is they don't do what you want them to do. Washington didn't do it. Adams said there was always an understanding with him and Jefferson that he would allow the Virginians to take this, to take the lead on this. And then it didn't happen. And when that moment arrived in about 1820, he said to John Quincy, okay, I have not took a, taken a leadership position in the emancipation issue because I've been waiting, but no longer can you wait. You go after him now. 
And that's what John Quincy did. He became a real force in the anti-slavery movement. Clay, do you do you think that that's a, a fair statement that slavery brought financial ruin to the South? Yes, but it's um, and, and 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 Axelrod's a good friend of mine, and it's a great question. Whether we could be concise in an answer of something this complex is hard to know. Well, I wondered about that. But you know. but but I'll take a slightly different approach from Joe's. Well, I agree with him, of course. Um, you know, de Tocqueville came in the 1830s and and examined America, and he said in the South, uh, there is this there's there's no spirit of enterprise that they the white people are so used to being waited on and having all the real work, the sweat labor, the hard labor being done by blacks by slaves that the white people have become uh, decadent and listless, and they don't really have the capacity to uh, improve, to progress. They're, they're kind of, they're, they're locked in this ignoble institution, which creates mutual dependencies and mutual degradations. And there's a famous um, scene in de Tocqueville's Democracy in America, where he looks at the Ohio River and sees that in the Kentucky side, it's all listlessness and ennui. And in the northern side, there's bustle and enterprise and steam and and, and the excitement of an economy. If you just think of Jefferson and Adams, Jefferson um, was a, a brilliant um, farmer uh, and certainly a great gardener. But how much time Jefferson actually spent with a spade or a hoe in his hands is hard to determine, but probably not much. Others were doing the, the labor, but but John Adams will write a letter saying uh, that he's been out shoveling manure in his farm. You know, John Adams was a, a New England Calvinist. They had poor soil, and the, and they are scraping profit and a living out of that land by sheer hard work, no slave labor, almost no indentured servants, almost no servants, and yet south um, of the of Maryland. There's this world in which white people are living like European aristocrats, while you know, scores of black people provide their every need for them. And that that um, erosion of the spirit of human enterprise uh, doomed the South. And, and to a certain degree, it doomed the South until almost the 1960s. When cheap labor there caused foreign investment to start to bring factories and other enterprises to Atlanta, to Alabama, and other states. And this, that spirit in the South is not 100% gone yet, but it certainly took a very long period after the Civil War for it to improve. Another letter I need to get in is uh, from Michael Belcher. Uh, he writes to defend John Adams, and he has an issue with you, Clay. Uh, he says he's a big fan of the show, your expertise in your books, but why do you make fun of John Adams? He says that he's read about Jefferson's manners and dinner conversations, but little about his sense of humor. On the other hand, Adams apparently had a great sense of humor, loved to tell jokes and laugh with friends. While I find much to admire about Jefferson, I think I would have preferred having a night of drinks and conversation with Mr. Adams. He's certainly right. Uh, that Jefferson had very little sense of humor. Adams had an exquisite sense of humor. Jefferson withholds his views of things, his, certainly his personal and emotional views of things. He is a determined stoic, and Adams never had a feeling that he didn't express in some way or other, much to his own shame at times. They're very different cats, and Adams is much more fun in our time because we live in a time of candor, and we love to get the inner view of these things, whereas Jefferson regarded his own civility as requiring him to self-censor in some really extraordinary ways. Why do I make fun of Adams? Because it's fun. And Adams was fun. <laughs> He's a sputterer, isn't he, Joe? When you're in character as an actor and a replicator and you're speaking to an audience, you really are offering a Jeffersonian negative interpretation of of Adams that is not really your own. Um, and even Jefferson, you know, loved the guy. Um, and um, so I think that the uh, the question isn't an accurate, it, you're, you're not really a, an Adams critic, hater, or anything like that. And you give him his due um, in, in all the programs that I've done with you anyway. Oh, I love Adams and I have deep respect for him, but I do think he, there is a, there is a comic essence at the center of Adam's life that he himself recognized and, and that that's what makes him so very interesting. And he also is a kind of a, 
he's a he's a sputtering preacher. He's got, he's constantly telling people what they should be thinking or or what they should be doing. And so you have to when I do Adams with, as Jefferson, I adopt a kind of tone like checks and balances, Mister Jefferson. Checks and balances, and that's exactly <laughs> the way it was, isn't it? Yeah, but you would didn't just as the listener said, he'd rather have a beer with John Adams. Wouldn't, don't you agree with me? I mean, I want to sit down with Adams and we can all have a Sam Adams beer together. And uh, <laughs> it will just be, it'll just be a more interesting conversation. And he will tell you things about his friends, the fellow founders, that you're not going to find out from anybody else. He's going to dump on absolutely everybody except himself <laughs> and sometimes himself. <laughs> because if you read the letters, he, he makes a, a, a real project out of that. I, I get it. I'd, I'd like to have dinner with either one of them, but not both at the same time. I, I would prefer Jefferson just because of the elegance, uh, the, the manners, the, 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 that Jefferson's serenity, uh, his capacity to expatiate on topics. You know, Jefferson was not an ad hominem guy. He would not say in a in a group of strangers certainly what he thought of Patrick Henry or what he thought of John Marshall. They're just it's apples and oranges. There's no way to compare them. But if you're looking for someone to have a beer with and to get the scoop on what Washington was really like, that's got to be Adams, not Jefferson. Okay, I have a couple more questions in the in the few minutes that we have left. Uh, I'll start with this one. It comes from Bill Gooseman, and he's asking for some suggested readings. He says, Clay, that you often mention how important the relationship was between Madison and Jefferson. Um, and he wants you to suggest authors or articles uh, that discuss the nature and importance of this relationship. Well, let me just give you one and joke and name others. Um, I like uh, the, the book, The Last of the Founders by Drew McCoy. It's been around for a long time, but it's a brilliant piece of work. How about you, Joe? I love that book, too, and it doesn't get the attention it deserves. If you really want to be um, a scholar about it, there's a three-volume collection of the correspondence between Adams, I mean, excuse me, between Jefferson and Madison. Um, it's available in paperback. Um, I, I, I like the book that, that, um, that Clay just mentioned. Um, there's a recent biography by a guy named Feldman, uh, who's a law professor at Harvard, who's recently been seen, he was witness in the impeachment hearings, um, on, um, the, called the three Madisons. And, um, and you can't talk about Madison without talking about Jefferson too. So it's a available in paperback too. That's a great book. It's really, an, uh, it, it, it's a long read, but it's a great book. And, and what are the three Madisons? There's the Hamiltonian Madison, the Jeffersonian Madison. What's the other one? Um, the third one is when he, he opposes the notion that, um, that states' rights allows for the right to secession that's being brought up by some of the Southerners in, in the 18, early 1830s. He says, no, that's not what we meant there. Um, the states are sovereign, but they still don't have a right to secede from the Union. Um, so he wants to redefine himself and Jefferson as not supporting um, this early version of secession. It's going to be a hard task with Jefferson. You know, I was meaning to say earlier in the conversation that one of the most important documents Jefferson ever wrote, which is largely played down by historians, perhaps for good reason, is the Kentucky Resolutions of 1898. Right. And in the Kentucky Resolutions, Jefferson essentially wrote the founding document for the Confederacy by saying, whenever the a state feels that the national authority is intruding too greatly into its affairs at the expense, perhaps, of the 10th Amendment to the Constitution, that state has a right to refuse to enforce that law within its own borders. Jefferson actually used the word nullification, and that document was used by John C. Calhoun and all of them, uh, Jefferson Davis, because it was seen as, as their declaration, their philosophical basis for the Confederacy. And so at, uh, Madden, Madison spent some time in the last years of his life trying to distance himself from the wilder states' rights doctrines of Jefferson. Gentlemen, we are out of time for this week. Many questions we didn't get to. Hopefully we can in a future program. If you'd like to ask a question or support the Thomas Jefferson Hour, go to jeffersonhour.com. And Joe, once again, thank you so much for being so generous with your time, sir. We're so appreciative of, of your 
insights and, and your ability uh, to look back over a long and extraordinarily distinguished career and provide insights here on the Thomas Jefferson Art. Dr. Joseph Ellis, author of a dozen books, all of which worth our time, and we will be coming back to them in the course of the next few months here on the Jefferson Hour. You've been listening to this special edition. We'll see you next week for another important issue of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education. The program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public. President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826, and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author Clay S. Jenkinson. To obtain a copy of this or any show for a $12 donation, please call 701-575-0727. This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.com and on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.com. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is produced at Makoche Recording Studios in Bismarck, North Dakota. Bach Cello Suite No. 3 in C Major by Stephen Swinford. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking, historically accurate program through the eyes of Thomas Jefferson.